Thank you very much. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here with, uh, with you. Uh, and of course, great news in the meantime. Uh, I cannot top that. Um, <laughs> uh, and uh, in fact, I have told the organizers that since I was absolutely convinced that uh, Suzanne and Michael are going to give you very, very detailed and very precise uh, observations and some hint of the theories of extrasolar planets and life, uh, I will actually uh, just present mostly speculations and philosophical thoughts uh, because I wanted to be somewhat different uh, from them and not I cannot actually compete with them in terms of the details. So uh, I call this our place in the cosmos and I really mean our place and by that I mean us humans, our place in the cosmos. So uh, you know we do live in a solar system which has eight, maybe nine planets, <laughs> but I'm not holding my breath because you know, it would take a while to confirm. And we had such stories in the past. There was a planet Vulcan that w p people claimed that they've, they've even observed, uh, which turned out to be nothing. So uh, maybe there is a giant planet with a period of 20,000 years, <laughs> but maybe not. So we'll have to wait and see. Uh, w what turned out to be rather interesting, I think, is actually that this demoted planet, which is now only a dwarf plan planet, turned out to be much more interesting than anybody expected. Uh, this is the surface of Pluto, uh, and it is extraordinarily rich, and it has these ice volcanoes and things like that, and also on different phases, it shows very different uh, appearances. So uh, we live on a small planet in an interesting system with eight or maybe nine planets, and even the one that is now only a dwarf planet turns out to be really quite interesting. Now, there is another thing that happened in this business of search for life and so on in the past year, and that is that on Mars, we seem to have discovered evidence that uh, there occasionally is uh, liquid water on the surface of Mars. Uh, and the evidence for that comes from, look at this area here, and now uh, look at the same area there, and you see these tracks uh, which appear to show that something was flowing there um, from the residues that they left so that it could be that occasionally water is actually flowing on the surface of Mars. Uh, I found it really interesting, you know, that we look at tracks like this and to signify the potential presence of water and we relate this to life. And, you know, there is this Catalan painter Jean Miro, which <laughs> painted this, Birth of the World, and look what he painted here. You see, what he did was he actually poured the paint over the canvas and made the canvas uneven so that it created these tracks. And this he, he painted for how life appears in the world. I, I find that interesting. Um, the planet that is still probably the nicest in our solar system is Saturn, and I put this, this short film here which shows a few of its satellites passing in front of it and you see how they cast the shadow uh, because you know that we talked about transiting planets and so on. These of course are transiting moons but look how beautiful you see those shadows that appear on the surface of, of, uh, of Saturn uh, and, and they move across. So uh, I still find this planet particularly interesting. In any case as Suzanne and Michael explained very nicely, uh, we now know that there are many other planets. And this is one that has been imaged. Uh, this is the star Fomalhaut, and you can see the track. We don't, well, it's not entirely clear if that's the planet or some dust of cloud around it, but there are planets now on, around other stars. So let me just recap for a second. We live on a rather small planet in a, around an ordinary star, and now we know that there are other planets. Uh, but not only we know that there are other planets, we know how they form. They form from clouds of gas and dust. Uh, by the way, whenever you see an image like this, and this comes, of course, from Hubble, that's the Eagle Nebula, 
uh, I don't know if some of you noticed this, but the pillars of these gas and dust always actually are in the direction of some very bright stars, which in this case they are just at the top of this image. And the reason, of course, it's, it's the radiation and winds from these very bright stars that erode away all the less dense dust and leave behind these densest pillars. And stars, new stars are being born here. There is one other thing, since I'm talking about humans and how we perceive the universe, you will notice that all, every time Hubble presents an image like this, the pillars are presented like this, as if they are standing up. And the reason for this is again the fact that here Thomas Moran, for example, caught this image from the American West, where we are actually used to seeing pillars of this type. And because on Earth we actually have a preferred direction, which is done by gravity, we like to show things standing up like this, just like this thing here. Now, Suzanne showed you the statistic. I just saw a diagram here, which is about a year old, because I couldn't find actually an update of this diagram to this year. Um, but uh, there are thousands of planets that we have discovered. Many of them are <coughs> sort of the size of Earth, or a little bit bigger than Earth. And by the time you scale this to the all the stars in our own Milky Way galaxy, you know, you get something of order a billion maybe Earth-sized planet orbiting stars that are a bit like the Sun or somewhat smaller, like M stars, uh, in the habitable zone. So we not only are we on a very small planet in a rather average si system, but in fact, there are maybe a billion systems like ours in, in our galaxy alone. So that makes our physical significance, and I emphasize the word physical because I will get to something else later, our physical significance appear somewhat less special. Now, I, I said that we are in our own galaxy, the Milky Way. We are, by the way, in a slightly special place in our own galaxy, namely we are close to co-rotation in the galaxy where we are. And that actually does relate to the way we pass through um, spiral waves in the galaxy. And some of you may know that there is even one person at least who with his, his collaborators claims that climate change is actually not due to humans mostly, but due to this passage through the spiral structure of the galaxy, which increases cosmic rays, and that affects the climate. Um, I will tell you, I don't believe it, but I, I, I've read those papers, and they are not stupid. So, um, you know, remains to be seen. So in any case, we live in a galaxy, and in our own galaxy, we are about two-thirds of the way out. We're not, we're not anywhere towards the center. Now, there are other galaxies other than ours, of course. We live in a barred spiral, a little bit maybe like that one, although that's an extreme case, uh, NGC 1300, but a, a barred spiral. There are other galaxies. There are elliptical galaxies, which are much older than ours. Uh, there are very active galaxies, which throw gas into space and so on. But my point is that there are many galaxies. And in fact, we know about how many, because we have taken images like this. This is the Hubble Ultra Deep Field, where you take the Hubble Space Telescope and you point it to a point in the sky, <coughs> to an area of the sky that's not much bigger than maybe the area you see through a drinking straw. And in that image, you see all these objects. And as far as I can tell, there are only two stars in this image, well, only two stars that you can see, which is this one here and there is one up there. Every other point of light you see here is a whole galaxy with 100 billion stars like the sun. And there are a couple of tens of thousands in this image. So you can multiply this by 4 pi and you will get a number that is something like 200 billion galaxies in the observable universe. Okay, so how unspecial are we? 
we live on this small planet <coughs> in a solar system. There may be a billion such things with Earth-sized planets in habitable zones around sun-like stars, roughly. And there are maybe 200 billion such galaxies in the observable universe. Now, I don't know if you start to get depressed by this, but things only get worse, at, at least in at first. And the reason I say that is that not only that is the case, but in fact all the stuff we're made of, which is ordinary baryonic matter, is less than 5% of the energy budget of the universe. So what's the rest? Oh, we can fly through the Hubble ultra deep field because we have measured photometric redshifts to many of the galaxies, so you can do this grand tour where you fly through it. And when you don't see anything anymore, it's not because there are no galaxies anymore, but there are no galaxies anymore for which we have reliable redshifts. So you can fly through this. But what I started saying is that we are only less than 5% of the matter in the universe. And the rest of it, about 25%, is in the form of dark matter. Now, again, just to be fair to all kinds of alternative possibilities, I mean, there is one small group of people, led by one scientist named Moti Milgram, who suggests that there is no dark matter, but rather that we have to change the laws of gravity in a certain fashion. There is a certain phenomenology known as MOND, and he suggests that maybe that's what does it. Uh, like I said, it's a small group of people. I think you can probably count on, well, maybe four hands, <laughs> the people who actually follow that. The rest of them believe that there is dark matter, in particular because of images such as this one. This is the bullet cluster. The red here shows X-ray emission, which is these clusters of galaxies uh, have in them hot gas. And when the two clusters collide, the hot gas collides electromagnetically, basically, and it produces, you know, this bow shock here. The blue stuff here is actually we use gravitational lensing, another one of Einstein's predictions about what gravity does, that it bends the path of light, to map the dark matter. And that's the blue stuff here. And the remarkable thing is that the two things appear to be fairly separated because the dark matter is extraordinarily weakly interacting, only gravitationally and through the weak interaction. And therefore, it basically flows through as the two clusters collide, while the hot gas actually does collide. So this is one of the best examples that we have to show that there is dark matter. Uh, these are similar examples. This one is from two clusters that collide pole on. And this is where the distribution of dark matter is, because you form something like a ring, you know, a little bit like you throw a pebble into a pond, and that's what you see here. So that's that thing here. So about 25% of the universe is dark matter while we are less, not we, the stuff we're made of is less than 5%. So become even less physically significant in the universe. And things get even worse. Because 70% of the universe is in the form of dark energy. So dark energy, we don't know what it is exactly, but we know it's about 70% of the energy budget of the universe, and we know that it causes the universe, the expansion of the universe to accelerate. And this was discovered only in 1998, so this is relatively new. I should mention, by the way, that Joe Silk and I wrote last year a paper about how one should try to expand the searches for dark matter, because, you see, the point is, the reason I say we shouldn't completely forget about Milgram and his modify gravity things, that we have still not discovered the particles that make dark matter. Um, there is an experiment in South Dakota called LUX. It just published about six months ago. It's l latest results, and they still see nothing. There is a one-ton xenon experiment in Gran Sasso in Italy. 
They will publish results with some luck maybe next year. Uh, and there are a few other experiments being conducted. We have still not found anything. I used to uh, ask Joe, uh, so in how long if they don't discover any dark matter will you say that there isn't any? And I asked him that about five years ago and he said five years. <laughs> when we have still not discovered. So I asked him, so what now? He says, give me another five years. <laughs> so, uh, you know, th that's how it is. Uh, the thing is that if at one point, you know, we will not find anything, we will have to say, well, maybe we should be more open-minded and think about other possibilities. But at the moment, almost everybody believes there is dark matter. Dark energy, again, we discovered the acceleration. It's apparently due to a repulsive gravity that is predicted by Einstein's general relativity. Uh, and it's about 70% of the energy budget of the universe. So it, it, this is the dominant form of this, again making us even smaller. This was discovered, of course, both uh, uh, using uh, type 1a supernova, these explosions that you can see halfway across the universe. But since then has been confirmed by cosmic microwave background measurements, uh, effects such as sachs wolf effect and others and so on. So Nobody doubts that the universe is actually accelerating. Now, you might have thought that the bad news stops here, namely in terms of our physical significance, but in fact, it goes yet one step further. And the reason is that when you actually try to naively estimate <laughs> how much dark energy there should be or what its density should be, when you do it most naively, by summing up over all the modes that you can have, you get a number that is about 123 orders of magnitude larger than what we actually observe. Now, a discrepancy of 123 orders of magnitude is big even in astronomy. <laughs> uh, and you, so you can say, do all kinds of tricks. And the tricks are of the type, then you can say, well, maybe there is supersymmetry, which is this extra symmetry which says that you have, for every particle that we know and love, there is a counter particle that we have not discovered yet, removed by unit of half of a spin. Uh, and th those tend to enter with positive and negative contributions. So maybe you have this incredible fine tuning where by adding up all these things, they, you know, cancel almost precisely, but not quite to zero. They leave this thing behind. But you must realize the level of fine tuning we're, we're requiring, if that would have been the case. We're requiring that you cancel 122 zeros, basically, 20 decimal places, leaving just one behind. That's a level of fine tuning. Now, if you add supersymmetry to this, the discrepancy is only by about 55 orders of magnitude, <laughs> which is still <laughs> enormous, yes? So uh, people, physicists normally don't like fine-tuning. In fact, they abhor fine-tuning, certainly at the level of 50 orders of magnitude. So what else can explain the fact that dark energy is like this? So people have suggested something extraordinarily speculative, but which is still in the context of physics and not metaphysics. And <coughs> that is that actually there isn't one universe, but our universe is one member of a huge multiverse. How huge? String theories tell us maybe 10 to the 500 universes. So the idea is that there, are there is an ensemble of maybe 10 to the 500 universes. We live in one of those. And the thing is that the value of the cosmological constant or this dark energy is not uh, something that is actually determined by from first principles, but rather it takes a random value in this huge ensemble. And if you have such a huge ensemble, you are going to get all kinds of values, including values that you think are very, very strange, but are still consistent with forming galaxies, stars, planets, and life. So the idea then is that there is this multiverse. Now the reason I say it is 
speculative physics and not some people think it's metaphysics, but it's not. And the reason it's not is that first of all, it does make one actually quite distinct prediction. And that is that our universe should have a negative curvature at the level of 10 to the minus four. Now, we cannot measure that today, but it makes a prediction that in principle can be measured. Uh, in addition, you see there are things, uh, this is why I said, uh, you know, I, I'm starting now to philosophize. Uh, Karl Popper taught us that theories should be falsifiable, namely that you should be able to make predictions that can be tested and <coughs> falsified by observations or, or things. The thing is, you see, that without knowing it, we have already gone beyond what Popper asked us to do. Because, for example, just to give you a small example, we all believe that there are quarks, but in fact, we have never seen a free quark. We will never see a free quark because actually the theory says that you will never see a free quark. Yet, why do we still believe that there are quarks? Because there are enough predictions in what we can measure to make us believe also in things that we cannot observe. So the multiverse is in that type of situation, namely, if it will make enough predictions in the observable part of the universe, it hasn't yet, but if it will, then we have to be prepared to believe its predictions also outside the observable parts of the universe. Oddly enough, again, some artists actually have anticipated what I'm talking about here. And Vasily Kandinsky painted this painting, which looks <laughs> just like my picture of the multiverse. OK, so what happened until this moment? So until this moment, our physical existence became less and less important at every single step, all the way to the fact that even our universe is not, is not unique. Why am I not depressed? Well. Maybe because I'm a cheerful person usually, although people say I'm a pessimist. But, uh, oh, I should mention this. You see, the value of the mass of the Higgs that was found also lends indirect support to the multiverse hypothesis. Because the value of the mass of the Higgs is very low, but the Higgs mass should get contributions from masses at the, scale, at the Planck scale, which is 10 to the 16 orders of magnitude higher. So we should have seen some supersymmetric particles with masses close to the mass of the Higgs. And so far, the LHC had seen none. Even some of you may have heard that there is a suggestion of a particle that decays to two photons at 750 GeV. First of all, we don't know yet whether that's true or not. But this LHC will start running again in April, and we will know whether that is there or not. But that is not going to change the fact that it's not close enough to the Higgs, so it would still require a high level of fine-tuning if that's all what that we're going to find with the LHC. High level of fine-tuning. OK, so I said, here is now the road to recovering our self-esteem and feeling of importance. The first thing, as you all know, we are stardust, which means the elements in our body were forged in stars. In this particular case, I took Mystic Mountain, formed stars. The low mass stars produce planetary nebulae, which produce most of the carbon and nitrogen in the universe. And the more massive stars produce supernova explosions, which produce neutron stars and black holes, the types that LIGO has just observed, but also produce things like iron, oxygen, and so on. So all the atoms in our bodies were formed in the universe, uh, in, in somewhere in the cores of some, forged in, inside some star. Not only that, this atom in my body may have formed in that star, and this atom may have been formed in another star. So, here is a phrase that maybe you never heard it put like this, but I, I, I think that this is encapsulates this. I mean, you can say we are stardust, but I say more than this. I say 
it's not only that we are in the universe, the universe is inside us. So that makes us very, very intimately connected to the universe. So that already increases our importance in the grand scheme of things. But there is something else. We have to ask, are we alone? And both Suzanne and Michael talked about searches for life, biosignature, and so on. So far, we are the only place in the universe in which there is life. Nobody knows precisely how many species there are on Earth, but the most recent <coughs> estimates put it at 8.7 million. So 8.7 million species of life on Earth, and yet this is the only place where we find life. It's more than that. There is a famous so-called Fermi paradox, and actually, Joe Silk and I wrote a, a short article for Scientific American, which just appeared last month, uh, about this question of you know how do you find life and what about the Fermi paradox? The Fermi paradox is, for those who are maybe from different fields, is simply if there is all kinds of intelligent life out there, how come we haven't seen any yet? And the reason for to ask you this question is that one can do a very simple back-of-the-envelope estimate and show that actually if you have a very, very advanced civilization, it can easily reach any corner of the galaxy within about 10 million years, which is nothing in the grand scheme of things. So how come we've not seen any of that yet? Now, let me tell you that there are no good answers to the Fermi paradox, but there are two answers that I like better than other answers. So one of them has to do with what happens to civilizations once they reach intelligence. And some of you may have read books by Ray Kurzweil and other futurists which say that at some point in a not too distant future, he would say in less than a hundred years, actually there will happen what he calls the singularity. Namely, you get artificial intelligence that surpasses humans. If that will indeed happen, then that means that the biological form of advanced civilizations may be a relatively short-lived phase, phase in the life of civilizations. And the advanced civilizations in the galaxy may not be of the biological form at all, in which case to find them, maybe we don't have a clue how to even look for them. So for example, there is this breakthrough listen that was announced last year. You know, this is an advanced SETI type thing, $100 million put into that. Uh, the UK is a very important part of that. Maybe they will find nothing because they don't know what to listen to at all. So that's one possible solution to the Fermi paradox, which I think is reasonable. I don't know that it's true, but it's reasonable. Another one is that there, is, there are some filters. There is a bottleneck which stops civilizations from getting too advanced. And that bottleneck could have been in our past, let's say in the transition from unicellular to multicellular life, in which case, if that's true, then maybe we are the first or one of the very first civilizations in our galaxy to actually reach an advanced stage. Now, that would make us extremely special. Imagine, we are the first intelligent civilization in the galaxy. So that's one possibility. There is a second possibility, which puts an even harder burden on our shoulders. And that is that the filter is in our future. Which means that advanced civilizations somehow annihilate themselves. They never reach that stage where you, they can populate the entire galaxy. Now, that means that we are doomed. 
And therefore, we have the responsibility to maybe show that maybe we can pass that filter. Makes us extraordinarily special, right? Now, there are things that are related to the actual search for life. This is the geological history of the Earth. Everything that we call history is within that black line there. But the point is that had we actually looked at Earth when the Earth was less than 2 billion years old, we would not have found life on Earth. We would not have found those biosignatures that Suzanne was talking about. We would not have known that this is going to be a place with life. Because to detect life remotely, you need life to actually dominate the atmosphere and dominate it in such a way that you can remotely detect that. Now, in a paper I did last year with Rebecca Martin, we actually looked at this question, and Suzanne touched on this as well, on how special is the solar system. <coughs> now, I'm not talking about small details, but in the big things. And in the big things, the, the solar system is not so special compared to other extrasolar planets. But there were two things which were identified which do look to be special. Now, I have no idea if these things have anything to do with the emergence of life, but they are a bit special. One is the fact that the solar system has no super Earths, no planets with masses of 10 times the Earth. The solar system does not. About 60% or more of extrasolar planet systems have super Earths. We don't. The second thing is if you look at the orbit of Mercury in the solar system, which is this thing here. You cannot see anything on this thing. Okay, It's this thing here. There is nothing in the solar system inside the orbit of Mercury. But if you look at all the other systems, there are lots of systems that have a lot inside the orbit of Mercury. Now, why is that? So, Michael described to you the super tank. A scenario in which Jupiter moved all the way in with Saturn, cleaned the inner solar system, then moved back out, you know, and so on. This could happen, but for my taste, it has too many moving parts. So in a second paper I did with Rebecca, which is just in press now, we looked at the possibility that the solar system actually had super-Earths, which did form in the inner region of the solar system. They cleaned the inner region, but the super-Earths were swallowed by the sun. Now, it turns out that that also requires some fine-tuning in terms of the densities in the disk. But it's not an incredible fine-tuning, but a certain level of fine-tuning. So I don't know if our solar system is special, but certainly this business that you know, we, there is life makes us somewhat special. Now, there is another reason why I think we shouldn't be depressed by our physical, apparent physical insignificance. And that is where I get really philosophical. You see, this, do you know who this is? This is Copernicus. Yeah? Before Copernicus, we thought that the Earth was at the center of the universe. When Copernicus discovered what he discovered, this was the first time we realized that we were not at the center of the solar system. In other words, if you like, before Copernicus, we were at the center of the solar system. Copernicus told us that we're not. Before Darwin, we thought 
that humans are at the head of some pyramid, that it is something, requires something really special, that it's like a ladder that you have to climb up and go. Darwin taught us that no, we are just a normal product of evolution. And we are actually not more evolved than anything else that exists together with us. Most of the species that were ever on Earth bec have become extinct. But everything that's now, it's equally evolved. So we're nothing special in this way. But again, it's Darwin, a human, who discovered that. This is Harlow Shapley, who at the beginning of the last century discovered that we are not, the solar system is not at the center of the Milky Way galaxy, but two thirds of the way out. A human discovered that. This is Edwin Hubble, after whom the Hubble Space Telescope is named, who for the first time showed that there are other galaxies other than the Milky Way. Before that, there were no other galaxies. And in fact, with his namesake telescope, is with how we got these 200 billion galaxies. And this is Alan Guth, who came with up with this theory of that the universe has undergone this inflation when it was a tiny fraction of a second old. And it is actually that theory that leads to the speculation of the multiverse. Because if you actually believe that inflation happened, it turns out that it is virtually impossible to avoid the formation of a multiverse. Because what happens is that the vacuum is caught in this peculiar state where it inflates like crazy, then some parts of it decay and form more leisurely expanding universes, but the vacuum between them continues to expand like crazy, and then some other parts of this, and you so form a whole multiverse. And like I said, string theory also independently says that there could be 10 to the 500 solutions. <laughs> and by the way, I didn't mention one other thing. The mass of the Higgs actually, believe it or not, well, some of you may know this, actually predicts that our vacuum, the physical vacuum of our universe, is actually unstable. In other words, we are caught in a state that is not the absolute minimum in terms of energy. We're caught at a local minimum that is above the global minimum. And so that at one point, we could decay to the global minimum, and that would be the end of our universe. Basically, the vacuum will eat up everything. Now, why doesn't it happen? Because those same solutions show that this happens on a very long time scale. And some people see in the fact that we are unstable, but on a very long time scale, is another indication that you know, we have to be <coughs> members of a multiverse to have such strange values. So we didn't know any of this before Alan Guth discovered it. In other words, what I'm saying is, that every step that I described in terms of our physical significance becoming smaller actually happened because of a simultaneous step in human understanding which expanded our understanding. That's how every step that I described happened. It was a human that discovered that thing. In other words, our physical existence diminished precisely as fast as human understanding expanded. So in that sense, we are extremely central to all of this. So let me finish with this drawing by Leonardo because Leonardo Leonardo didn't know any laws of physics because none were formulated before his time. So he formulated four laws of mechanics which were all wrong. 
But that's not important that they were all wrong. The important point was that he wrote multiple times that those same laws have to describe both the microcosm, which to him mean, for example, human anatomy, and the macrocosm, to him, which to him meant the universe at large, the universe that he knew at large. He did this without knowing any laws. What we have now discovered, and by the way, on today only showed it so beautifully again with the discovery of gravitational waves, is that indeed we have now shown that we have a set of laws that describe both the tiniest scales and the largest scales. And that all came from the human brain. So that's why you shouldn't get depressed, because we are very, very central to all of this. Thank you. <laughs>